You know, before we dive into Matthew chapter 24, I think it's best to first offer to you an exposition and a, and a kind of a summary of not only what we've learned this far in Matthew about the crucial role that Jesus plays in redemption history, but also what we will learn in the coming chapters of Matthew. I mean, after all, is not his entire purpose as the Redeemer, our one and only hope of having peace with God. Now, what we've been doing for 78 lessons is creating pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, which, when assembled, reveal the entire image that the pieces are cut from. Now, I understand that the larger the puzzle, the more challenging it is to fit those pieces into something coherent. It'd be much easier for us if redemption weren't such a complex matter that encompasses so much more time in history than is covered in the gospel accounts. Yet, if we cannot construct this puzzle in a way so as to arrive at a meaningful point and end that changes our understanding, changes our lives, then all we've been reading and studying amounts to is little more than a series of interesting short stories about Jesus. So the question becomes how to create a framework for understanding a matter that is so immense in its scope as God's plan of redemption and Yeshua's role in it. I believe that such a framework can best be formed by characterizing the various historical mile marker events as stages along the way. Stages along the way of redemption history as opposed to listing a series of individual encapsulated generations, each as having expiration dates. Now, most pertinent to our study of the Gospel of Matthew is how Yeshua self-defines his purpose as the Son of Man and places himself exactly where he fits in the cosmic puzzle of the redemptive plan of his father. But in order to understand the role of the Son of Man in this plan and the when of his appearance and activities, we must turn to the book of Daniel. Christ's firm recorded conviction that he himself is that son of man, something he calls himself numerous times, and that he is taking his cues about both the timing and prophetic history and the purpose for his existence it comes from the prophet Daniel. Now, when we work our way through Matthew chapter 24, we're going to encounter this passage in verses 14 through 16. And this good news about the kingdom will be announced throughout the whole world as a witness to all the Goyim, to all the Gentiles and Gentile nations. It is then that the end will come. So when you see the abomination that causes devastation spoken about through the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand this illusion, that will be the time for those in Judah to escape to the hills. <clears throat> See, the vital point we must constantly maintain within our vision is that Yeshua's validation as possessing the persona as the divine Son of Man appears within the context of the fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel. And in order to help us better get, a, get a better handle on this matter of the timing and the role of the mysterious character called the Son of Man. Let's read, the Daniel, let's read Daniel chapter 7, where this is foretold. 
So open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7 and follow along with me. Daniel chapter 7. Take a moment to get there. Daniel chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babel, Daniel had a dream and visions in his head as he was lying on his bed. And he wrote the dream down, and this is his account. I had a vision at night, and I saw there before me the four winds of the sky breaking out over the great sea. Four huge animals came up out of the sea, each different from the others. The first was like a lion, but it had eagle's wings. And as I watched, its wings were plucked off. And it was lifted off the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a human heart was given to it. Then there was another animal, a second one like a bear. It raised itself up on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and gorge yourself with flesh. And after this I looked, and there was another one, like a leopard with four bird's wings on its sides. The animal also had four heads. It was given power to rule. <clears throat> After this, I looked in the night visions, and there before me was a fourth animal, dreadful, horrible, extremely strong, with great iron teeth. It devoured, crushed, stamped its feet on what was left. It was different from all the animals that had gone before it, and it had ten horns. And while I was considering the horns, another horn sprang up among them, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. In this horn were eyes like human eyes, a mouth speaking arrogantly. And as I watched, thrones were set in place. The ancient one took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, the hair on his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames with wheels of burning fire. A stream of fire flowed from his presence. Thousands, thousands ministered to him. Millions, millions stood before him. Then the court was convened and the books were opened. I kept watching. Then because of the arrogant words which the horn was speaking, I watched as the animal was killed and its body was destroyed and it was given over to be burned up completely. As for the other animals, their rulership was taken away. But their lives were prolonged for a time and a season. I kept watching the night visions. When I saw coming with the clouds of heaven, someone like a son of man. And he approached the ancient one, and he was led into his presence. And to him was given rulership, glory, and a kingdom, so that all people's nations and languages should serve him. His rulership is an eternal rulership that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now, as for me, Daniel, my spirit, Deep within me was trouble. The visions in my head frightened me. I approached one of those standing by and asked him what all this really meant. He said he would make me understand how to interpret these things. These four huge animals are four kingdoms that will arise on earth. But the holy ones of the Most High will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever. Yes, forever and ever. Well, then I wanted to know what the fourth beast meant, the one that was different from all the others, so very terrifying with iron teeth and bronze nails which devoured and crushed and stamped its feet on what was left, and what the ten horns on its head meant, and the other horn which sprang up and before which three fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth speaking arrogantly seemed greater than the others. I watched. And that horn made war with the holy ones and was winning till the ancient one came. Judgment was given in favor of the holy ones of the Most High. And the time came for the holy ones to take over the kingdom. And this is what he said. The fourth animal will be a fourth kingdom on earth. It will be different from the other kingdoms. It will devour the whole earth, trample it down and crush it. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise, and yet another will rise after them. Now he will be different from the, uh, from the earlier ones, and he will put down 
three kings. He will speak words against the Most High and try to exhaust the holy ones of the Most High. He will attempt to alter the seasons and the law, and the holy ones will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. But when the court goes into session, he will be stripped of his rulership, which will be consumed and completely destroyed. Then the kingdom, the rulership, and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the holy people of the Most High. Their kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. All rulers will serve and obey them. This is the end of the account. Now, as for me, Daniel, my thoughts frightened me so much I turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. You had that vision, you think anybody would have believed you? See, Daniel was one of many thousands of Jews, Jewish exiles of the Babylonian conquest of Judah. He was in Babylon serving Belshazzar at the time when he had a dream vision that utterly unnerved him. It included strange animals that we could rightly call monsters, which symbolized something that would appear sometime in the future. And his vision revealed that several kingdoms, really empires, would be established and then overthrown by the next one to follow until the Son of Man finally made his appearance. He'd come in the clouds, and he would then be led into the presence of the Ancient of Days, which is another term for God the Father. The Father would then establish his own kingdom on planet Earth with the Son of Man as its ruler, acting as the Father's agent. And until the previous Unlike, rather, the previous four kingdoms, each of which existed only for a time, this new kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, would endure forever and never be overthrown. Even more, the real ruler over these previous four kingdoms, which we take to be Satan, says in Daniel, will be stripped of his rulership, which will be consumed and completely destroyed. What this is talking about is what Christianity calls the end times, when Satan and his demons are thrown into the lake of fire. Now, this is something that the Jews also believed would happen, although they gave it, gave it different names, such as the end of days or the world to come, olam haba in Hebrew. Now, in a much-studied work from the first century called the, called the Assumption of Moses, also known as the Ascension of Moses, we get a glimpse into the beliefs of its Jewish writer, who, as near as we can tell, was not a follower of Christ, what his thoughts were about the end times. Now, before I give you a short quote from that work, I'm afraid I need to hit you with a scholarly word <clears throat> that's important to our study of the stages of redemp redemption history. <clears throat> and that word is eschatology. Eschatology. This term comes from two Greek words that means last and study. So it's the study of last things. Or as Christianity has adopted, the study of end times. Now, the word was coined because there's always been a wide disagreement within both Judaism and Christianity over which last things occur when and whom they're associated with. Eschatology, then, is a term used to indicate the study of most anything and everyone and anyone that is thought to be associated with end times matters. Now, of the <laughs> many emails I received, some of the most frequent ones that are asked me things like, are we in the end times? When will the tribulation happen? 
When does the rapture occur? What does it look like? When exactly does Messiah return? In other words, who among us as God worshipers and Bible believers doesn't wish we had been given a precise, exhaustive, biblical flowchart and a well-defined timeline of redemption history and of end times events. Well, keep on wishing. <clears throat> the Jews of Yeshua's era and before were just as interested in, in such things. And so, of course, formed their own end times beliefs, which is why the book of Daniel played such a prominent role in the minds of even just the common everyday Jews, but especially so in the minds of the religious zealots. The occupation of Rome over the Jews' homeland made most Holy Land Jews, at least, certain they were already living in the end times. Thus, for them, the end, which included Judgment Day was at hand. Obviously, they were wrong. Or were they? Now, because the Christian New Testament, which did not come into existence until nearly two centuries after Christ's time on earth, or until around 150 years after Paul's death, it is usually the Gospel writer John that is given credit for giving us the best understanding of the timing and the sequence of end times event in his most famous work, the book of Revelation, which he wrote not long before he passed away towards the end of the first century. However, well before that time, it was Jesus that added new dimensions to our understanding of the stages of redemption history and thus when certain important events would occur, and most importantly to nearly every Jew and every Christian, when the end would finally arrive, and what were the signs that it was near. Very interestingly, Yeshua's understanding and timeline did have several similarities to what was already believed within early Judaism. So here now is that quote from the Assumption of Moses. It says, And then shall God's kingdom appear throughout all his creation, and then shall the devil meet his end, and sorrow shall depart with him. The question that immediately confronts us is, when is the then? That this Jewish writer about the apocalypse had in his mind. When, that's what we all want to know. Now, remembering that this was written during or near the time of Jesus, it is clear that this Jewish writer was expecting some major change in history to occur, the end of history, to be more specific. But for him, it was in the future and not imminent. Yet, in fact, his belief, as we read in the Assumption of Moses, was not the mainstream Jewish belief of the times. It was also not the belief of Christ's 12 disciples. And it was not the belief of John the Baptist. All of these folks were fully expecting the prophesied coming of God's kingdom and the defeat of Rome and of the devil's destruction, and of the fulfillment of Daniel's prophetic vision, and of the great judgment to happen immediately, or at least within their lifetimes. So then, can we create a flowchart of the stages of redemption history to better help us decipher it, to get a little closer to the when of the end times events. I think we can. And I think it would look something like this. First, creation to the fall of Adam. Second, 
the fall, to Noah. Third, Noah to Abraham. Fourth, Abraham to Moses. Fifth, Moses to John the Baptist. Sixth, John the Baptist to the end of the millennial kingdom. And seventh, the recreation of the heavens and earth. Now, in truth, we could probably divide that sixth stage into two. From John the Baptist to the return of Christ, who inaugurates his thousand-year reign, known as the millennial kingdom, and separate that as its own stage. And thus, a separate stage that is the thousand-year reign itself, which comes prior to the new heavens and earth, thus giving us eight stages of redemption history instead of seven. Now, I'll explain this flow chart. But before that, I have to say something to try to smooth out some of the speed bumps that can happen when studying the end times events, eschatology, coming from almost any teacher. Because every writer, every teacher that presents his or her thoughts on the matter will speak of eras or dispensations or generations and then give them names or titles along with beginning and terminating event markers. I suppose I'm doing no less. However, where I differ with many of them is this. First, dividing things up into eras and stages involves a level of arbitrary choices. And it is simply our human way of trying to explain the complex and the mysterious. Dividing things up into more bite-sized chunks to try to examine them individually in order to help make sense of it all can be helpful. Yet I have no doubt that God would not see what he's doing in redemption history as being a series of named stages or eras. My second difference is that despite my own flow chart that seems to mark beginnings and endings of various stages, by no means is it my intent to communicate some sharp lines in the sands of time or that everything that comes before a new name stage is subsequently replaced, abolished, and made irrelevant. Rather, the mental picture that I, I, I wish to impart is, it's, is that, uh, as though there were named mile markers placed beside a long winding river upon which we were riding the unstoppable current. The river never stops flowing or changes course simply because we place some convenient mile markers on its shores. Nor will we ever find a firm line running across those waters that someone has placed there saying, we've crossed from one stage of the river to another. Nor that what came before, and this is important, nor that what came before any of the mile markers ceases to exist if we look over our shoulder once we passed it by. If any of the stages that we had already passed by did suddenly cease to exist, then the source of water for that flowing river would end as though a dam were erected. The flow of water, the flow of redemption history would necessarily stop. And so everything that lay ahead on that river would dry up. That would be the end of our ride upon those waters. I want to give you another analogy for a mental picture. I hope that you'll adopt using child development. Even the Bible speaks of stages of child development. However, I'm going to use more modern terminology. We begin with fetus, the newborn, infant, toddler, middle childhood, adolescence, and finally, young adulthood. 
This represents a flow, not sharply defined stages that have hard stop and stop points. It doesn't just end and another one starts. Also, each new stage of child development does not abolish or make irrelevant the ones that come before it. Rather, the physical, mental, and emotional development of a child that happens often nearly imperceptibly, tiny steps by tiny steps, is the result of the next stage growing atop on account of all that was learned and retained from the previous stages. However, contrary to this concept of the flow of redemption history, the highly popularized system within evangelical Christianity of the generations of redemption history called dispensations, and there's other systems like it as well, defines each generation as though they can stand alone and independent from all the others. What came before the most current stage vanishes, and redemption history hits the reset button. To say it another way, we can see what happened during a previous stage that brought us to this new stage, but when this new stage begins, it's as if it broke all connections and bonds to the previous ones. This, the previous generations or stages are to be forgotten. They're to be pushed aside as obsolete, if not now alien, to our current existence. Therefore, the only purpose of any of the stages is to get us to the next one. Each stage is depicted and defined as a full replacement of the previous one. Thus, with such a mindset was born the errant Christian doctrine that each of God's covenants replaces the one that came before it. The idea being that only one covenant at a time can be in operation in any one dispensation or generation. The covenant of Noah, therefore, became irrelevant and replaced by the covenant of Abraham. The covenant of Abraham became irrelevant and replaced with the covenant of Moses. The covenant of Moses became irrelevant and replaced with the new covenant, the covenant of Christ. Now, I strongly disagree with that entire mode of thinking because that's not how God's Word operates. It's not how covenants operate, and it's not what the Bible depicts. Each stage of redemption history, each covenant in this illustration, only works properly if all the memory, all the substance of what came prior to it is retained. And then it's used as a building block and a stack of building blocks. So what we arrive at is this. Was everything that Jesus taught about in times events meant only for an undetermined future time? Or was his advent in the first century a sign that the end times was underway? Now, what I've just described to you is not only the crux of debate and doctrine about redemption history within the modern church, it was the crux in debate, uh, of debate and doctrine on the same subject among the Jews of Yeshua's day. Now, let's take a couple of the stages of my redemption history flowchart to help us examine this rather large and very challenging question, but one we have to do. We have to address this. I'm going to begin by very briefly offering a sketch of what each stage represents. And remember, these stages are my own concoction and created only for the purpose of illustration. 
to help us understand the totality of redemption history and then Yeshua's place within it. Creation up to the fall of Adam is essentially the period when all of God's creation was operating within the perfection that he created it. Now, we're not going to get into a debate over the length of time that may have been. Rather, the idea is that the first stage of redemption history marks its place with the fall of Adam when God's perfect creation was ruined by human sin. Thus, stage one created the need for redemption, the need for redemption, and thus set into motion all the future stages that would follow to satisfy this need. Stage two, Adam to Noah. This represents a period when the result of the fall was that wickedness increased so greatly that God decided to purge it from the earth. He used a calamitous flood as that purging mechanism. He saved the only eight people from death out of all humanity, those few he deemed righteous, as the seed corn to begin humanity anew. Stage three, Noah to Abraham. This represents a time when all the world was essentially Gentiles. That is, there was only one type or category of people on earth. Each people group of Gentiles had again become wicked. Each chose its own God or gods to worship, developed its own set of rules, ethics, morals to live by. But with Abraham, God made a covenant that set one man apart from all others to inaugurate a special people group meant to serve only the one true God. Step four, stage four rather, Abraham to Moses. Now this special people group began, uh, begun with Abraham in time became the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob, who was a grandson of Abraham. And this people group worshiped God, but their worship and their lifestyles soon became much like the people around them. Because of a famine up in Canaan where they were residing, they wound up in Egypt to survive, where, under the protection of Jacob's son Joseph and then his immediate successors, they grew into enormous numbers. The Egyptian pharaohs that came later enslaved them and made their lives bitter under forced labor. Stage five, Moses up to John the Baptist. God rescued the enslaved Israelites from Egypt. This was God's first act of redemption in redemption history. Once all Israel was redeemed, God gave to Moses, Israel's leader, his laws and commands for them to live by that covered virtually every area of their lives including their relationships with God and with their fellow man. However, over the centuries, these laws and commands were perverted. They were twisted by Israel's leaders, effectively replacing God's laws with their own. John the Baptist appeared and announced that a Redeemer had arrived to redeem Israel not so much from a political oppressor, not from Rome, but rather from their own sins of breaking the law of Moses. Stage six, John the Baptist to the end of the millennial kingdom. Now the redeemer that John announced was Yeshua, and Yeshua represented the second redemption. He was also Daniel's son of man. So John proclaimed that the appearance of this man represented the time for the Jews to repent of their sins. Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of heaven and broken through because of John. And the arrival of the kingdom of heaven was the gospel that he preached. 
Now it can be argued that since the millennial kingdom is but the kingdom of heaven operating on earth at its fullest, then even though the kingdom of heaven exists right now in our time on earth, beginning with John the Baptist, it's still maturing. So then from John the Baptist to the end of the millennial kingdom is but one lengthy stage that's characterized by the existence and the maturing of the kingdom of heaven. Yet I think maybe a better way to view it is that from John the Baptist to the beginning of the millennial kingdom that is marked by the return of the Redeemer, Jesus, is its own separate stage. That could be helpful. So while the kingdom of heaven is indeed here now, it's yet nowhere near all it's going to be after Christ returns to purge the entire planet of evil people. Once that occurs, then there will be 1,000 years of Yeshua personally ruling planet Earth as its king, and there will be peace on Earth and goodwill abounding among men and thus the kingdom of heaven will be operating at all of its fullness. And yet, wickedness will again raise its ugly head and need to be purged. Stage seven or eight, if you prefer. This is the recreated heavens and earth. The current universe as we know it, earth included, will be melted back to its elements and reformed. This is found in Revelation chapter 21. Even the devil will no longer exist. Thus, from that moment forward, all will be eternal. Time comes to an end. There will be no evil, no sin, no death present in the recreation. No longer will there be decaying of matter. It will be like an eternal Garden of Eden, only better, because there will be no possibility of a fall. All barriers between heaven and earth will be taken down. Heaven and earth will meld together as one. Redemption history is complete. So now getting back to that sixth stage of redemption history that is marked by the appearance of that desert wild man, John, Jesus said concerning the kingdom of heaven, if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. That's in Matthew 12, by the way, verse 28. So, you see, there can be no doubt that the primary visible proof, visible proof of the arrival of the kingdom of heaven on earth was Yeshua driving out demons from people by the power of the Spirit of God. Yet, the kingdom, the arrival of the kingdom of heaven certainly did not mean that the devil was completely defeated, even though the coupling of those two events was central to Jewish belief at that time. And since we know in retrospect that the coming of the Son of Man, Yeshua, did not bring with him the immediate destruction of the devil, this means that it has to occur at a later time. And since the destruction of Satan and of the great judgment were both to be presided over by the Son of Man, and that those two things had to happen more or less at the same time, then clearly Yeshua's presence in the Holy Land in the first century represented some, but not all, of what the Son of Man would do. Therefore, it is as with the parable of the farmer who plants a seed and comes back later to find that not only the good seed he's planted has sprung up, but also have some pesky weeds. But he instructed that the weeds were not to be pulled up by his workers just yet. 
because it might harm the good plants in the doing. Therefore, the farmer would wait until harvest time. Both the good plants and the weeds would be harvested together. Afterward, the weeds would be separated away and burned up to destruction. The good plants of the harvest would go into his barns. Thus, what Jesus has introduced is an end time scenario of some of the expected things happening now, now meaning in his time, but more of the expected things happening later. It is not an issue of one or the other. Yet, even with his teaching on the end times, it explains an eschatology that requires beginning a redeeming process at one time and then later returning to further that redemptive process, few of his followers ever seem to grasp it. That's the reason that we read in the New Testament of this urgency among Yeshua's 12 disciples, then later of Paul, and of other apostles to hurry and at all costs spread the news of forgiveness of sins in Christ in, in, in order that people could become part of the kingdom of heaven because they felt time was short. They still believed that Messiah's, Yeshua's arrival meant that the end times had to be coupled to it. Therefore, they were in the end times. Now, why did they insist on holding on to that view? Because the concept that when the Messiah in the Son of Man role arrived, the Jews' liberation from Rome, the great judgment, and the destruction of the devil all came along with it. And because Yeshua's followers accepted that only trust in Yeshua could save a person at that great judgment, then they were willing to pay any personal price to get that message out. Now, one of the more controversial things that we learned several chapters ago in Matthew was that, as strange as it seems, John the Baptist could not accept that Yeshua was the end time son of man. He was terribly confused by Christ's teachings about the son of man and the end times. See, this is why the imprisoned John sent messengers to Christ asking, are you the one who has to come or should we expect another? Why couldn't John accept Yeshua as the Messiah and the Son of Man, even after baptizing him, witnessing the Holy Spirit descend upon him. It was because Jesus defined an end times timetable that was different from John's understanding and the one that was generally believed among the Jewish public. So we find ourselves circling back now to the issue I spoke about earlier in the lesson. In attempting to deal with something as, as cosmic in scope as redemption history, even when we just take a portion of it to examine, we have to figure out a framework to discuss it in terms of events that have happened, will happen, in what order, and what, at what time. We also have a little choice, but to break it down into smaller pieces that we can give a name to each piece for no other reason than to be able to communicate that thought some type of an orderly fashion. Unfortunately, sometimes we can get so caught up in names of the different pieces and portions that we think they are God-ordained pieces and portions. And even names for them, when in fact they're not. And so we're going to have to do it yet again. <laughs> 
because it better enables me to explain the differences between how John the Baptist thought things were supposed to go compared with how Jesus said they were going to go. Here's what John the Baptist thought. He thought they were living in the present age of wickedness that had been ongoing for some indefinite period of time, perhaps since before Abraham. Second of all, upon the appearance of the Son of Man, who's also Israel's Messiah, that simultaneously would come the great judgment with the Son of Man doing the judging. And third, that after that, the end of the world happens and recreation occurs. That's how John saw it. Here's what Yeshua taught. He taught there was an unnamed age, probably since Moses, of the righteous living alongside the wicked that had been the norm. Second of all, that upon John the Baptist's announcement, the Son of Man appeared, who's also Israel's Messiah, and the Messiah brought with him the kingdom of heaven that included the possibility of forgiveness of sins by means of trust in him, which in fact was the requirement to become a member of the kingdom of heaven. Third, he's taught that later in the future, the Son of Man will also come, resurrection of the dead will happen, the Son of Man will operate in the role of the judge, the great judgment, and a fully developed kingdom of heaven will come about with him as its king. And fourth, after all this will be at some point a destruction of the present world and a recreation of the universe and the earth. So when we see these two very different sets of end times expectations side by side, then we can understand why John could not bring himself to accept his cousin as the Son of Man. And this is why Yeshua would respond to John's jailhouse inquiry to him by, by saying this in Matthew 11, 4 through 6. Go and tell Yochanan, John, what you are hearing and seeing. The blind are seeing again, the lame are walking, people with sarat, skin disease are being cleansed, the deaf are hearing, the dead are being raised, and the good news is being told to the poor, and how blessed is anyone not offended by me. What neither John nor the Jewish people in general could accept was the idea of two appearances of the Son of Man, separated by a long interim period of what I'll call the Messianic Age. Again, that's my words, not God's. That is, it's an age when Messiah's promises and influences are in operation, and the kingdom of heaven is here, but it's in a slow development process. So one has to be, has to, has to carefully place John's thoughts on the order of events of the latter days and the end times events versus Christ's. And to be very careful not to accidentally mix them together to create some fictitious hybrid of the two. In my opinion, this mixing is what has caused some of the strange Christian eschatological, eschatological doctrines that we have now. Now, part of what can confuse modern believers is that two terms, the latter days and the end times, at times become conflated. Sometimes they're spoken and taught about as though they're just two terms that mean the same thing. It seems that is essentially how the biblical Hebrews took those two terms to mean in both Old and New Testaments, and those, rather in those times, the Old and New Testament times. But what Christ taught us and what history is in the process of proving is that in the course of redemption history, all of it, all of it, 
from creation to the recreation of a new heavens and earth, there are two latter days, but there's only one in times. And although related, they are different things that happen at different times. And those terms more represent eras of time rather than specific events. Now, I define these two eras in the following way. The first latter days were the decades leading up to, during, and immediately following the coming of Christ and then His crucifixion. The second latter days are the decades leading up to and during the second coming of Christ that is yet to happen. On the other hand, the end of days or the end times is associated only with the second latter days and its immediate outcome. The end of days includes resurrection, the cataclysmic conditions that result from the return of Messiah, the war of Armageddon, and the battle with forces of the Antichrist, and then climactic moments that usher us in to the millennial kingdom when the kingdom of heaven is matured to its full estate. Now clearly, this has yet to happen. So the end times did not happen in Christ's era can only be something future to us. The end of days will also include the pouring out of God's wrath upon the earth, and the great judgment is judged by the Son of Man, Jesus. This, of course, has also not happened. Now, while there's so much more I'd like to tell you, I think it's time to draw this part of today's lesson to a close, and I'll revisit it at a later time. See, my purpose for today's exercise was to try to bring some of the weightier puzzle pieces of the Gospel of Matthew together to better understand the impact of Yeshua on redemption history as a preparation for chapters 24 through 28. I also presented you today with a flowchart of redemption history that takes us from the beginning, creation, to the new beginning, recreation. I gave you seven or eight stages of redemption history as a framework for how to think about its many milestones along the way. I also explained how what Jesus taught about the latter days and the end times and the sequence of events that involved the Son of Man differed in important ways from what John the Baptist and the Jewish people in general believed. And thus, why John, while John ushered in the kingdom of heaven, sadly, he would not be part of it. Matthew eleven eleven. Yes, I tell you that those among uh, that that among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than Yochanan than John the Immerser. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So the, in the stages of redemption history, history, as I defined and named them, where in that mix are we in the 21st century? Without doubt, we're somewhere in the sixth stage. We're in the stage when the kingdom of heaven has been planted here on earth, but it's still developing. We are still in the same stage that was inaugurated by John the Baptist. That was 2,000 years ago, wasn't it? So we've been living in this same stage of redemption history for 20 centuries, which means, man, it must be really ripe. just waiting to flow into that next stage, which is the return of the Son of Man as that great judge and the king of the kingdom of heaven. Next time, we'll jump right into those inspired words of Matthew chapter, chapter 24 and then the several revelations from Yeshua that come with it. Help support God's people by purchasing items made by them. Merchandise with a meaning, products with a purpose, holylandmarketplace.com. For more teachings, visit, support, or donate at torahclass.com. 
Join with us in worship and enjoy God's Word at Seat of Abraham Fellowship.